uh, at least you have a more attractive person to deal with right now than Dr. Makosi Kaza. So if that's of any relief. Uh, basically, I was hoping to respond at the end of this debate uh, after having heard what others have said. But as it happens, uh, I have to speak. Order, now. honorable members. And what is unparliamentary? Honorable Karim, will you just continue? Honorable members, we are busy with the debate. Can we continue, please? Fine. Now, this bill, as Makosi Kosa will explain, uh, and Tandi Tobias Pokola, uh, deals with uh, attending to strengthening our combating of financial crime and terrorist financing. Order, honorable deals members. With uh, ensuring that those who are involved in human trafficking or drug trafficking are dealt with far more actively and far more stringently in terms of the law than has been the case until now. The government has committed itself from uh, 2009 onwards to deal with this issue through the Financial Action Task Force, which interestingly, uh, the former uh, member of this house, Kadar Asmal, and former minister chaired in 2005 and 2006. And uh, we have, through our engagement in the United Nations Anti-Corruption Convention, also committed ourselves to attending to these matters. Now, when we passed the Financial Intelligence Center Act, the original act in 2001, we actually were quite advanced. But as it happened, we hadn't anticipated the full implications of 9-11 and how we'll have to combat more actively terrorism financing. Nor do we fully understand the extent to which our country may be used for the financing of drug trafficking and human trafficking. And so it is that when the evaluation was done by the Financial Action Task Force of the OECD in 2009, they found that South Africa was lagging behind the international standards and requirements in terms of legislation. Now, as you know, our financial system is very globalized now. And uh, whatever we do in our own country is also substantially influenced by uh, the global financial system. And so, for example, banks that are based in South Africa also have connections with banks, for example, in the UK. If you take uh, the example of Standard Bank and you take the example of Barclays Bank involvement in APSA. So the regulator in those countries act very, very harshly on the banks in South Africa that do not abide by the international norms. Also, it's, if we do not implement what we're seeking to do through this bill, it also affects trade and investment. And certain countries and, and businesses in those countries are reluctant to engage with countries that have not met these minimum standards. When we got the bill before us, we had extensive public hearings. And amongst the issues that were raised in the public hearings were the following. One, that various stakeholders claimed that national treasury did not consult adequately with them. Secondly, that there's a need for a national risk assessment. Thirdly, the bill they said was too prescriptive and defeated the risk-based approach it sought to introduce. Fourthly, the requirements for ongoing due diligence were onerous, especially with single transactions or prospective clients who may well decide not to continue with a business relationship with an institution. There should be a transaction exemption amount for a single transaction, they said. The definition of a politically exposed person in the bill is wider, they argued, than the international standard requires and includes a prominent person in the private sector. This would be difficult to implement without a list of prominent persons in the private sector who undertake business with government. The bill, they said, moreover, has a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't take into account the wide differences in the scope, nature, services, and structure of the different sections of the financial sector. The definition of client, moreover, they said, may result in unintended consequences in some sectors, such as attorneys' profession and the casino industry. A number of the updated FATF standards and recommendations underpinning the bill, they argued, are relatively new, and it's not clear how they will be implemented. Sufficient account, they argued, was not taken of the costs and complexity of implementing some of the provisions of the bill. There should be a provision, they said in the bill, that provides for a consultative process with the public and industry, especially with regard to exemptions, directives, and regulations. Our responses were to say that, firstly, we recognize there's an urgent need to combat financial crime, terrorism financing, and other related crimes more effectively. 
and the aims of the bill we fully supported. It is recognized, however, we said, that it would be difficult to implement such a comprehensive bill overnight, Minister, and there's a need to take account of the diversity of the financial sector. The committee proposed, therefore, that these challenges be dealt with through phasing in aspects of the, of the bill, providing for exemptions of the sectors of the industry, and ensuring more effective regulations, directives, and guidance notes. The Minister and Direction of FICA will facilitate the amendments to the bill facilitate this, sorry. Amendments to the bill will also provide for regular consultation with relevant stakeholders on these issues. Some flexibility was introduced on certain provisions along the lines of comply or explain why you can't principles. The committee accepted the difficulties National Treasury presented in financing, finalizing a national risk assessment and agrees that this not be done before the adoption of the bill and that the institution's specific risk-based frameworks can address the key relevant issues. However, the committee believes that National Treasury, together with other relevant government departments, should seek to finalize the national risk assessment within a reasonable time frame. The definition of prospective client was removed from the bill and left to institutions to determine in their risk management and compliance programs when a person becomes a prospective client. Due diligence measures for identifying the beneficial owner of legal persons were also made less onerous by clearly providing for incremental or cascading steps, steps. The minister will by regulation decide a threshold on a single transaction below which there will be a less onerous due diligence on the client and no ongoing due diligence. The minister of finance will delay the effective date of those provisions relating to the private sector prominent influential persons until government makes such a list available. However, the current unavailability of such a list should not deter institutions from under undertaking their own risk profile of their clients and undertaking their own due diligence. National Treasury agreed that the compliance costs will be continually assessed and monitored with the industry. Parliament will receive a report on the implementation of this bill at least once a year. Now, the committee acknowledges that a large number of investigative authorities which could have access to information in the possession of the Financial Intelligence Center, their information is therefore raising the question of possible abuse, especially if some of these institutions are highly politicized. The center is urged, therefore, to share this information that it has in a responsible manner with the strictest conformity with the law. While the fight no, order, against members. financial crime must be intensified, it is important not to abuse people's right to privacy. We want to say that this bill is especially important. All of us are committed to combating crime and terrorism financing. And we hope that all parties in this House will support this bill. It's long overdue. It's highly necessary. It's crucially important to our struggle and, and combat against crime. And we look forward to this House fully supporting this bill. Thank you indeed.